Welcome everyone to Infra Plus webinar series. Let's introduce myself. My name is Juliano Costa Gonçalves. I am a professor at the Department of Environmental Science at the U Federal University of São Carlos. And am I responsible for share this first session? Infra Plus webinar series are convened by Dr. Deliana Yosifova and her team. I would like to thank you, Deliana and Norma, for inviting me to share this session. The Infra Plus webinar series aims to identify links between context specific infrastructural challenges, approaches to their solution, and universal mechanisms towards improved sustainability. Infra Plus will be running up to until July, almost on a weekly basis. So do please feel free to check out events to come via Eventbrite and definitely register if they are of interest. Please also share the events widely among your colleagues and students where you see appropriate. The webinar will be recorded Records will be posted on the Infra Plus uh, and SUS Infra website and YouTube. So today we welcome four amazing speakers who will give us four talks with the focus area of South America. Each talk will be delivered at around 15 minutes and we then have 10 minutes to open up questions and discussions for the, and the audience. Attendees will be able to participate through the chat. I would like to introduce today's speakers. Uh, Dr. Jorge Luis Nobre Gouveia works at CETESB. CETESB is the Portuguese acronym for Environmental Company of Sao Paulo State. Dr. George has PhD in Sciences from the Energy and Nuclear Research Institute and Master's degree in Public Health from the University of Sao Paulo. Graduation in Industrial Chemistry from the Federal University of Paraíba. He is currently manager of the Strategic and Institutional Development Department at CETESB. Today, Dr. Jorge will be speaking about the organizational characteristics of CETESB and the current challenges faced in responding to the critical environment problems, such as accidents and disasters related to, to different environmental hazards in the recent context of the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. The second speaker is Dr. Denise Lozano Lazo from University of Tokyo. Dr. Denise recently concluded her doctoral studies at the graduate program in sustainability science, global leadership initiative at the University of Tokyo she has a master's degree in development studies at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva. Her research focuses on solid waste management system in Bolivia and, more broadly, on urban challenges in developing countries. The third speaker is Dr. Cristine Diniz Santiago from Federal University of São Carlos. Christine has PhD and master degree in environmental sciences at the Federal University of São Carlos, state of São Paulo, Brazil. She is manager and environmental analyst and worked between 2016 and 2018 as a consultant for the Pan American Health Organization, providing technical support to the Department of Public Health Engineering of the National Health Foundation regarding the management of research development. To discuss 
in this first session. Mr. Sidney Furtado, he is director of the Department of Civil Defense of the Municipality of Campinas, State of Sao Paulo, Brazil, representative of the UN campaign Brazilian Cities. Um, today, Dr. George will be speaking about the organizational characteristics of CETESB and the current challenges facing in responding to critical environment problems, such as accidents and disasters related to different environmental hazards in the recent context of the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Dr. Denise will be speaking about municipal solid waste management that remains a challenge issue in most development countries with a rapid urbanization adding an additional pressure to local governments, resulting various negative impacts to the environment, public health and quality of life. Presentation of the needs introduced the application of a transdisciplinary and system-based approach in the study of sustainability of the municipal solid waste management system in Santa Cruz de la Sierra, a rapidly urbanized seat of Bolivia. Today, Dr. Christian will be speaking about waste management in the pandemic, obstacles, learnings, and lessons. The pandemic highlighted existing issues for waste management in Brazil and the new ones arose. In this context of disaster, the goal was to reflect based on the vulnerability dimensions related to waste management, focusing on a transdisciplinary approach. So I will give now the floor to Dr. Jorge. Thank you, Juliano. Thank you, Juliano. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm in charge of the, the strategic and institution development of the Department of CETES. And first of all, I'd like to invite the Thank you for the invitation. And say that Dr. Patricia apologize for not being able to participate in this event today. So as I have, I, I have a hard task to replace her, of course. Sorry for the expectations to, to see her today. But let's see. Uh, in this uh, presentation, and this short presentation, I will try to show how CETESB is structured and how deal with environmental issues, especially with uh, environmental accidents. So just to begin, uh, CETESB was established in 1968. So CETESB during the last five decades has improved and has learned a lot with the challenge to face with environmental problems especially the state of Sao Paulo, for those who are not from South America and Brazil, is a complex system, and especially due to our population, the size of the state of Sao Paulo. But uh, we have uh, approximately 1,600 employees, technicians, a diverse group of experts around the state of Sao Paulo, such as we have 46 branch across the state and 18 labs. Uh, some of them in, in, in our head office in the city of Sao Paulo and the others on the countryside. Uh, basically, uh, our mission, we, as you can see here, is to protect the health, the public health and the environment, both connected. Here are some of the activities that give support to CETESB in order to, to, to for, for the permit activities in the state of Sao Paulo. So environmental monitoring and pollution and pollution control. Environmental monitoring is something that CETESB has 
different groups, labs, and experts to do this task. Inspection of the license potential for polluting activities, inspection lines of vegetation, cutting and interventions in permanent preservation areas, response to chemical emergencies, risk analysis, environmental training. So that has a school and provide technical uh, training for not only for CETESP technicians, but uh, to receive people from the other agents. And based on the Several environmental monitoring networks has been operated over time, assess the work, the quality of air, surface, groundwater, and as well as beach and coastal waters. It has been published every year, reports with those uh, issues. And in this image here, the, the first, the, the, the report of air quality was launched last month. But you can also have access, for example, in, a, in an app, you can check, you can see the, the air quality of air every hour as the same with the, the, for the coast water quality. You can check and see how is the quality of that beach. And so it has, uh, has a, a permanent open, uh, working 20 hours for day uh, response for chemical emergency or environmental accidents, receive calls from population, fire department, civil defense, and the other institution agents, receive the call and put the actions in duty to, to, to support and participate of the accident, of the emergency. According to this, to this data information, CETA has started this activity in 1978 when the, uh, an oil, uh, oil spill on the north coast of Sao Paulo caused a large uh, damage to the sensitive areas at that region. So it has been noticed, realized that need, uh, need, needs to organize it, uh, you know, people for, for dealing with environmental accidents. So in the last, the last 20 years, maybe 50 years, an average of 350 environmental access, almost one per, per day. Basically, these activities, according to this, to this illustration, most of the accidents happen in road transportation for obvious reasons for Brazil, for this, the road transportation is more, much more used and followed by industries and the other uh, uh, other causes of uh, environmental accidents. Uh, here's so just to give an example of some manuals, some guidelines that CETES produce in order to help people from CETES, from other states. Um, unfortunately, it is available only in Portuguese, but this was published in 2014. And for this, for, for Giving this response, it has, has special vehicles e equipped, like firefighters, but <laughs> firefighters from the environmental agents in order to give us this. It's the same model using a uh, US EPA for the local, even for federal uh, level in the United States and local, uh, local agencies in every state. So it has been to uh, uh, learn a lot with this model and apply it here in. São Paulo. Here are some actions that are made, that are taken to minimize the damage to the, the property, private and the public property, the environment and the community during the environmental accidents. And then, uh, talking about environmental accidents, this, the, here, these are some of these actions taken when, when in the first moment in the measure situation, what you need to do to reduce the impact of soil and water to avoid contaminated areas. So in, a, in situ assessment, substance identification, their risks, their main risks, requirement of suitable polluting actions to assure appropriate actions of, for life and environmental safety, monitoring the areas with due to the 
dangerous substance, noxious substance, sampling collection, if need, some parameters you need to detect in real time, and some you can collect and send to the labs. And just to give an example, sample collection is necessary to characterize the, the emergency situation in order to take what are the, 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 the principal uh, intervention you need to reduce the contamination. And another example of the fauna, the survey of fauna, in this case here, uh, birds, oilets, uh, uh, oil but substance. Product identification involving their main risks, as it has we collaborate with other regions, other states of the of some of the Brazil of Brazil, and even in Latin America. Here it's a very important task during an uh, emerging situation. Reduce the amount of waste, of, uh, of, of chemical waste, of, of hazardous waste. And in this case, to illustrate, it's a, a, an oil spill and a, a, on sand in a beach. And you have to very carefully uh, remove surface, surface, uh, the sand contaminated, not to generate a large amount of, of, of waste. Here, uh, just give you an example of inter how can an accident cause an, an, an interruption, uh, the, uh, very uh, uh, damage to the society. Here is a, a very important highway in the, in the state of Sao Paulo and on arrival of the city of Sao Paulo. Then the, 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 the highway was blocked in, for two hours in both directions, caused by an emergency situation. Can you imagine the, 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 the difficult situation for people not, they are, are, are not allowed to, to arrive on, to work or to study or to do anything? And this accident, for example, you have to use uh, uh, specifically PPE, you know, uh, personal protective equipment, working together with civil defense, with firefighters, in order to evaluate the damage. In this case, the, 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 the driver died caused by uh, uh, the accident and the corrosive, uh, corrosive substance involved in the accident, hydrochloric acid. Here in a rural area, so an accident in a rural area, um, and during uh, when the, the, the sugar uh, is transported by truck to the station and then transferred for by train, but during the storage uh, it was uh, a, a fire uh, caused a, a very very uh, uh, serious damage to the the water of the river because the sugar caramelized burned. Uh, uh, get into the river and cause the death of more than 10,000, uh, about 15,000, 14, I think 14 tons, 14 tons of fish. And not caused by a chemical substance, caused by sugar. Why? Because it causes the, the decrease uh, of the dissolved, the dissolved oxygen level. Here are some images of the trying to, to rescue some fish still alive. And here, the, one of the most, I think in the world, the most serious fire in a maritime terminal involving chemicals. And in this case, products, gasoline and ethanol. This accident took place in 2015 and it was during uh, for nine days, nine days, burning tanks, four tanks, I think, four tanks of gasoline and two tanks of ethanol and interrupted the, the activity, the industrial, the economic activity of the in, the, in the region of the port of Santos. So firefighters been for, for nine days. So imagine the damage to the air quality, water, soil, and the fauna. And one of the problems faced in this 
accident was the large amount of chemical foam to extinguish the fire. It is some of these products is still very toxic. And it caused toxicity uh, combined with the, the rising of the temperature, the foam chemical, and the gasoline compounds, organic compounds, cause the, the fish, fuel, uh, fish kill of 10 tons of fish. Imagine this, when it's happened, we have to remove immediately, not to allow people, the population, the local community to catch this, 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 this fish, of course, because probably some of the reasons are toxicity. Here are the, our infrastructure to deal and to support people in the field, the laboratories, the, the, to collect fish to, in order to investigate the cause of death, collect samples, and then uh, launch a technical report based on all these elements. So in this case, the cause of the death was low oxygen and toxicity plus fish tissue and sediment analysis of quality evaluation. Here, another image of the large amount of foam used in this case. Here, another example of cooperation of CETESB, in this case, not in Brazil, but in Antarctica. CETESB pro provides support to the Minister of Environment. Of Brazil and named uh, CETESB to participate because of a fire that occurred in 2012 and it destroyed our Brazilian base in Antarctica. And this, of course, research there with labs, chemicals, gas, and the, the, the fuel used in, the, in Antarctica to, to the boats or to the vehicles caused the contamination of the soil. So in the first moment, CETESB sent two technicians, and then it was accomplished during almost eight years. CETESB every year sent missions to the summertime of Antarctica in order to collect topsoil, sediment, uh, topsoil, groundwater, and soil in order to evaluate the contamination of the air. And here, as you can see, in last year in January, the, the our Brazilian base was a, a new, a new one. It was uh, installed, installed a new base. So the work finished uh, in 2020. Probably, I don't know if we continue going to there. And Cetesb High School has said Cetesb has a postgraduate course, environmental compliance with legal technical requirements and a program of courses that uh, an open course for people in general that come to CETESB to take part in this training course and specialized practical training that is offered in our labs. Of course, most of this training last year was uh, not allowed to, to to offer, especially those courses that involve visits, technical visits in the industry, landfills, etc. And here are some of the actions that we do before the accident or after the accident in order to, 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 to study the causes and the, the lessons learned in this in order to prevent, involving agents, government agents, private sector, and the other agents. in order to, to prevent uh, the accidents also happening in, on, on the coast. Well, as I told you before, the first accident that CETESB registered in 1978 was with an oil spill. But oil spill in the state of Sao Paulo, for those who, are, who lives in, in Brazil or in Sao Paulo, probably will not remember when was the last oil spill. 
Why? Because many things were uh, adopted, preventive measure, measures. So constantly, we, we, I, I'd say that we were much more in preventive actions than in corrective actions. In this case, there is a national plan, a regional plan, and a local plan, and we work in the local plan in the state of Sao Paulo, in the north coast, there is a port, and uh, the region of uh, the, the region of Santos, on the port of Santos, there is a, a regional plan where many uh, local plans are connected, are put in together in a regional plan in order to prevent oil spill and to be more prepared, more equipped, and to have to 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 to, be, to, be, to, to have an, an, a better uh, response. This is, for example, the two plans of Santos above and of São Sebastião Port. There are two plans that every month people work together in a meeting to discuss, to, to do drills, uh, simulation, exercise in the field, to put in practice the, the best practice to, to, to combat oil spill. So thank you for your kind attention and we have a good day today and good work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jorge, uh, for your informative and instructive uh, speak about CETASB activities. Uh, so, We can continue to the next presentation. I will now give the floor to Denise. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. So I will uh, share my screen now. I hope you can see it. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a participant at the webinar. And I will share with you a little bit of my uh, doctoral research uh, process, of, which, which is based on the solid waste management in uh, Santa Cruz de la Sierra in Bolivia. And just to start a little bit with the background, well, um, I would like to talk about the solid waste management as the SDGs. So as many of you may know, the solid waste management has been uh, considered to be a critical issue and a cross-cutting issue, which interacts with at least uh, 12 of the SDGs. And most, uh, among the most important are the SDG six through the target in the elimination of waste dumping, the SDG eight through the circular economies implementation involving both formal and informal recycling sectors, SDG 11 through the improvement of waste collection coverage, and um, SDG 12 to the advance in the three R practices and efficient use of natural resources. Now, why is solid waste management so important, particularly for developing countries? Well, um, in there is a great discrepancy even until now in the performance of solid waste municipal solid waste management systems throughout uh, countries according to their uh, industrialization or development level. And in developing countries, uh, it's usual that at least uh, even the most basic uh, aspects such as collection coverage or collection quality or the safe uh, environmental disposal are still under low levels of performance. Uh, but moreover, there is a, uh, the largest increase in terms of the waste generation is occurring in developing countries and more particularly uh, lower middle income countries. And this is due to different uh, issues such as the changes in production and consumption patterns, as well as um, the population growth. And also there has been more and more uh, a recognition of the increased, increased complexity in these uh, countries, which also affects uh, topics such as the um, sustainability of the solid waste management. And some of these issues are related to urban, urbanization, inequality, economic growth, 
cultural and socioeconomic aspects, uh, the political landscape, which is uh, so conflicting in many of the uh, countries in South America and Latin America, and also the external de dependency on funds for implementation of uh, solid waste management projects, not only at the beginning, but for the total or the continuous operation of these infrastructures. And particularly in the Latin American region, some issues that also add uh, to this complexity uh, affecting solid waste management are the high rates of urbanization uh, in this region. And maybe because of the, there is this idea of the um, uh, large availability of land, there has been a preference uh, for disposal techniques related to open dams and sanitary landfills leading to a relatively low rates of waste diversion compared to, for example, uh, countries in Asia, developing countries in Asia. And these recycling activities depend almost completely on the informal sector for the recovery of the recyclable material. Um, now, uh, I won't talk in detail about all the, the objectives of my research, but uh, some major goals that, uh, were, uh, that we tried to achieve together with my supervisor was to first to try to uh, grasp in a better way this complexity that I've uh, talked about uh, using a system perspective to uh, try to understand in a better way the interactions among the different elements and dimensions of the municipal solid waste management system. Uh, at the same time, to increase the attention on the social dimension of the, of the municipal solid waste management, moving away from a purely engineering approach that I think is still uh, predominant in, in Bolivia and probably other countries of, of the region. And finally, to try to apply a transdisciplinary approach involving both academic and non-academic actors uh, throughout uh, the research stages and also trying to um, apply or combine uh, different types of methodologies. Um, again, uh, without going too much into detail, the research scope included uh, mainly uh, four major components. And the first one was related to an institutional analysis, which was trying, which aimed to understand the sustainability transitions of the solid waste management in the case study. And this was done through mainly semi-structured interviews. Uh, after that, we uh, tried to do this uh, systemic modeling of solid waste management, which we did in a participatory way, which stayed with stakeholders from the main uh, groups, uh, stakeholder groups involved. And they basically uh, provided the, the inputs to understand which were the more important variables in the system, the most important impacts, and how they interact with each other. And this activity led to identifying which were the practices or the most important practices that needed to be assessed. So the next stage was the assessment of practices, which use uh, mainly surveys and statistical analysis, but also other types of um, methodologies to complement the results, such as a participatory observation and also uh, video recording activities with the informal waste picking sector. And from that, uh, they, these results also serve as an input for uh, the last step, which is, was a, a software simulation in order to uh, explore future outcomes uh, of different, uh, under different scenarios. Um, just to explain a little bit more about the, the case study, uh, as I mentioned, is the city of Santa Cruz de la Sierra. And um, well, uh, well, Santa Cruz de la Sierra is the capital of the Santa Cruz department in Bolivia. Bolivia as a whole is a relatively small country in population. It has 11 million people in, divided in nine main administrative div uh, divisions, which are called departments. And Bolivia is uh, one of the uh, countries with the lower, uh, lower development indexes in, in Latin America. Uh, however, Santa Cruz de la Sierra is considered to be the economic pole of the country, and it has uh, the largest population, the municipality, around 2 million people, and we, considering the metropolitan region, a little bit more than uh, 3 million people. And because of this uh, economic growth that the city experienced in the last decades, it started to attract uh, many people from different areas of the country and also from abroad which led to an accelerated population growth uh, that um, was uncontrolled and that led to urban sprawl and illegal settlements that made uh, the provision of public services more difficult. 
Um, and well, as you can see, uh, the, the, there is mainly some horizontal expansion in the infrastructure. Only in the city center, you can see a little bit more uh, vertical uh, constructions or infrastructure. So uh, as long as uh, uh, when you start moving away from the city center, you see uh, these things that uh, such as the lack of pavement in the streets, um, maybe in some areas uh, lack, lack of sewage, stray animals, and all these things have some impact in the way that the um, uh, collection and the solid waste management activities are carried out. And um, as you can see here also, the, there, there, is, uh, there has been a, a exponential increase in the solid waste uh, collection in the city, which comes predominantly from uh, household areas. And um, because of this uh, rapid urbanization and the lack of ability to cope with these issues, we can see in, in, in the city uh, the results of uh, household waste dumping, uh, backyard burning or household, household waste burning, and um, the recycling activity, which is done in an, with, without regulation and, and without much support, which leads to also to risk for the people that engage in, in these activities. Um, and just to go a little bit in, in, more into detail with the, with the setting, you have um, mainly two parts, uh, the formal part, which starts right after the people generate the waste and take it out, whether they put them in some container or directly in the floor, then the waste is collected and is transported directly to the landfill. So there is no intermediate uh, transfer station or anything like that. And in theory, there is supposed to be a separate collection of only recyclable materials, which are supposed to be taken to a municipal separation plant. But in reality, the extent to which this is implemented is unclear and it's definitely not consistently implemented um, in, throughout the city. Um, at the same time, there is a, an informal uh, setting, an informal part of the system, which starts right after the generation with people that independently or through uh, uh, small groups, familiar groups or, or in small associations collect the material, the recycled material from the assorted waste. If they have the capacity, they try to store it in order to uh, generate economies of scale. And then they, they sell it to middlemen, which who act as um, uh, intermediate in between them and the recycling industries. Now, uh, about the research activities that, that we conducted, um, as I said at the beginning, we started by an institutional analysis, trying to understand the perspectives from different stakeholders um, about their evolution of the solid waste management, both at the national and local level, the sustainability from their view about in the Bolivian context, the barriers and enablers that they are identified, and also the roles and main interactions with, with other stakeholders. And uh, through that, we were able to more or less to some level of detail uh, identifying the main connections uh, between these stakeholders and also which were the, the most important ones. Um, and also through the interviews and through the uh, bibliographic uh, review, we were able to identify that basically there have been three, um, three transitions in the focus of the, of the sustainability or in the solid waste management. And uh, the first one mostly focused on just collecting the waste and disposing it in a centralized way. The second one through the creation of the landfill, the only landfill in the city. And the third one where there is some attempts to, to engage in some circular economy approaches. But because of this rapid urbanization and the explosive growth of the city, these three um, uh, transitions are, are uh, overlapping with each other and none of them is fully complete. So they, the three of them uh, compete in, with, in terms of um, um, budgetary allocation and, and importance for the, for the government. Um, the second stage was related, as I said, to systemic modeling. And through that, we used the uh, uh, group modeling, uh, group modeling building workshops uh, using the causal loop diagrams tools. And basically what we did in that in those sessions, what was with uh, some of the main stakeholders involved in the, um, in the activity in the city, we map these variables and these impacts uh, uh, identifying which was the ones that they thought were the most important. And in, in that sense, we were able to create a, a qualitative uh, map uh, divided in five main models, such as waste generation, 
the common solid waste management practices, separation practices and recycling activities, uh, waste disposal, and one for the main flows and costs. And it's from those, from these um, uh, sessions where uh, the main activities that were gonna be uh, researched or assessed were identified. So we decided to focus on household waste because that was the, the one that was considered the most important. And we uh, did three studies related to the household waste. And um, for, for each, each one of them was quite important for uh, the overall results of the, of the research and also for the next steps. So the first, uh, the first uh, research activity was related to the characterization and overall the in researching the waste generation rates in the, in the city and the influencing factors. So for that, we work with, uh, with the municipal cleansing company, a local university, and also the informal waste speakers, which uh, instructed the students, the, the students into which how they could identify in a better way the different types of components in the waste. Um, the next stage was the household surveys to try to understand in a better way how, uh, why people engage in um, certain type of activities such as dumping and, and burning and also what motivated them to um, separate or recycle the recyclable materials. And that was also quite important to count with the support of another uh, of the universities in the in the city, because otherwise the the people in the in the households would not communicate with us, would not be would have some suspicious suspicion about talking to us and giving information. Uh, finally, the part uh, with the way speakers was also it was also quite important to. Uh, use the contacts that we established at the beginning through the interviews where we uh, involved the, the leaders of these uh, associations. And through these contacts, we were able to reach these people who are originally quite um, distrustful of, of giving information to, to researchers. Um, as I said, I won't go in much into detail about the uh, results, but basically uh, throughout the household solid waste management practices, we identified that large parts of the population do not have basic conditions to comply. And so it's not a, maybe a lack of awareness or education, but more uh, uh, about the, the conditions to comply with these requirements. Um, and also we identified that there was a relatively high source separation, uh, despite the lack of a formal system taking in place. Um, about the waste picking activities, uh, we identified that there was some fragmentation process that has been, had been occurring in the last decade due to the uh, disease of NGO support and the new activities taken by the private cleansing company. But despite of this fragmentation uh, and even the associations at the moment of the surveys were not, not all of them were active, still the effects, um, the, the effects of this association process were seen in the different outcomes comparing people who were associated versus people who were not in, in part of these associations. Um, yeah, just some findings and reflections and some challenges and limitations that, but maybe we can leave this uh, for the Q&A session in order to, to not take so much time. Um, yeah, that would be it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise to share with us the Municipal Waste Salt Management in Santa Cruz de la Sierra. Thanks. Um, remind us, attendees will be able to participate through the chat. Please type your question, your questions or comments. Uh, to the next presentation, I will give the floor to Christine. Thank you, Professor. Well, greetings, everyone. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank very much Professor Narma and Professor Juliano for the invitation to be here today. 
I'm really honored to be among such brilliant people working towards improving our cities. And uh, I share some of our work on waste management in the pandemic, obstacles, learnings, and lessons. For a brief context of this work, it was part of a book Professor Norma organized on the multilayer crisis we are facing its challenges and how to face them. So I co-authored this chapter, which has the same title as the presentation with Professor Giuliano, who's chairing this, this session, and Professor Erika Pugliese, also from the Federal University of San Carlos. So to start with a brief context of the pandemic in Brazil, we had a late arrival of the disease if we compare to Asia or Europe countries. And uh, as most of you should know, we did not have a central response for, from our government. Also, our government showed no consideration for the World Health Organization guidelines. And there was a lot of denial about the pandemic in our country. And it was even considered the worst, uh, the worst government response to the pandemic. So we had four health ministers in a period of more than less, little less than two years. And this led us to a situation of more than 470,000 deaths up to now. In this context, the pandemic is a disruptive event and it also exposes our development model that does not internalize the externalities. So we can consider the pandemic as a disaster, which can be understood as a threat that hits a vulnerable society. Well, uh, talking about a little bit about waste management in Brazil, we have uh, federal directives since 2010, that's from when we had our framework approved. And uh, even though the directives are from the national government, the cities, the cities are responsible to implement waste management. So there is a huge need for articulation and good governance. I think Denise uh, talked, uh, talked a little bit about that as well. Also, we have a very representative informal recycling se sector represented by the waste pickers, as we can see in the lower picture here in the slide. And we have a characteristic of having many manual processes as opposed to automated ones. So how was the waste management during the pandemic in Brazil. We uh, had a generation variation. We had uh, cities that saw a rise on the waste generation, others had lower waste generation, also logistics. So in many cities, the regions, the central and commercial regions did not generate as, generate as much waste because of the lockdowns and other restriction, restriction situations. And uh, this caused uh, logistic challenges for our systems. Also, we had a huge rise on healthcare waste, as well as uh, many other countries. And the worker safety was really a challenge because of the, our very manual uh, characteristic. So we tried to reflect and analyze obstacles and learnings during this pandemic, this disaster, considering vulnerability dimensions and future possibilities. So this is a uh, transdisciplinary approach that we did. To start talking about the vulnerability dimensions and waste management, in 2001, McIntyre proposed six dimensions to analyze vulnerability, and those dimensions are physical, social, cultural, political, economic, and technological. Of course, the, those dimensions are isolated, they were proposed isolatedly, but they are obviously linked and very much intertwined. Uh, so the dimensions help us to do the analysis, help us to observe certain aspects isolately, but it's important not to lose the big picture. Starting with the physical dimension, we have uh, hazardous and potentially contaminated waste as a huge risk for society and workers especially in the beginning of the pandemic, when we did not know much about the prevalence of the virus in different surfaces. Also, we have a link with the technological dimension, 
because we have those essentially manual processes, as I commented before, like in collection and recycling systems. Also, uh, the pandemic potentialized infrastructure risks, such as inadequate ventilation, which uh, maybe some facilities already have and were potentialized, and healthcare waste brought risks related to the storage capacity in healthcare facilities. Regarding the social dimension, the lack of knowledge by the population led many times to inadequate disposal of waste. For example, the disposal of protection masks along with the recyclable waste. And this meant risks for the waste pickers, mainly. Also, uh, we, have, uh, we had our resilience weakened by a no prevention and no source segregation culture. So it was even harder to adapt to new directives or new uh, in this new situation. And also talking about the selective collection, which uh, happens formally in less than 40% of resilient cities, according to the government. We have several types of responses, but generally, generally it was not observed as an essential service in here in our country, unlike other countries, for example, in the global north that did not stop recycling systems. Regarding the cultural dimension, we have a very negative perception towards waste. So people see waste as having no value instead of seeing the reinsertion possibilities. And there's also a lack of individual responsibility. So people are just worried about the removal of the waste of their doorstep with no, not much worry about where is it going afterwards. Also in this context, workers are invisible to society, especially with, uh, waste pickers. And there is a resistance by society to pay for waste management services. And this is a serious problem here in Brazil because it potentializes already poor economic situations of the cities. And also here we have links to the social and economic dimensions. Talking about the political dimension, uh, the federal government was omiss, not only in waste management, but also in this area, which led to poor planning and prevention, and really was even harder to go through this moment. When you analyze regional planning, uh, the state's planning, you see that the directives they had for emergency situations did not apply to the pandemic. So when states uh, uh, thought about some kind of prevention, they thought about interruption of the services due to strikes, for example, and the responses uh, they, they, uh, they foresee in the documents do not apply to this pandemic context. In the local level, cities' responses were diverse and mostly reactive. So there were, although there were few contingency plans, they were highly operational and did not uh, have much participation of the society or were not uh, much focused on communication, which makes it hard for the strategy to be implemented. And also the situation potentializes low participation in public policies. Regarding the economic dimension, uh, we had a huge oscillation of recyclable prices, and this potentializes the waste pickers' vulnerability, and they are already a very vulnerable group in our unequal society here in Brazil. And with situations of quarantine or circulation restrictions, it meant that waste pickers could not work and consequently did not have any income because they are informal workers. Also, if they try to go to work to get some income, for example, to eat or pay their bills, they were, uh, there were huge risks of contamination because they had no money for protection like masks or gloves because their prices of this equipment rise uh, a lot during the pandemic. Also, the bad economic situation Brazil was already going through was worsened by the pandemic, and this means more people working as waste pickers, and this can generate situations of conflicts with groups already working and disputes for regions and so on. 
Also, uh, the pandemic potentialized per financial situation of cities' budgets. And uh, in Brazil, waste management represents a huge part of the city expenses. And this means a threat to the services, not only in quality, but in terms of continuity of the services. And here we have a huge link to the social dimension. Finally, talking about the technological dimension, we had uh, healthcare waste overcharging completely completely management and treatment systems and this was not only a brazilian reality but we also had a lot of inadequate disposal of potentially hazardous waste and uh, representing risks for humans and also the environment and lastly brazilian waste management model proved to be fragile not resilient poor in planning and only having basic infrastructure, meaning it was very hard to adapt and demands lots of improvements. Considering this, we tried to analyze waste management together with the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. So basically, we tried to look at waste management through the disaster and risk management perspective. Then we see that waste management is a very important aspect when talking about disaster and risk management. And uh, Dr. Jorge commented a little about this. And then our exercise was to, was to see what learnings can, learnings can we uh, take from the Sendai framework. And uh, the, those learnings are that waste management risks and vulnerability vulnerability need research and action and we need to work in areas like communication accountability capacity building and articulation also it's necessary to integrate disaster and waste management so we need waste planning to include disaster prevention and resilience as well as participation and safety of the stakeholders um, the third point is that logistics and financial investments are needed for research and policy and also for workers' resilience. And the last is that it's necessary to have recurrent reviews on preparedness, on strengthening tools to awareness and communication, also promoting resilient infrastructure for essential services. So uh, we can conclude that as any other disaster, the COVID-19 pandemic exposes vulnerabilities in all dimensions we analyze here, but it also helps us to understand those dimensions. And uh, it's obviously necessary to create a culture of prevention, preparedness and resilience for disaster and risk in waste management in Brazil. And this demands learning from experience and also working towards a more equal society, which distributes risks in a more equal way. And here, as we could see, uh, the risks were very much focused on the more, most vulnerable group, which, which is the waste pickers group. Also, learning from a disaster is what's really positive about uh, the occurrence of the disaster. It's the only thing positive about it. And if we do not learn now with this opportunity, it may lead us to worse disasters and worse responses in the future. So it's really something we should be working on from now on. And uh, last, it's important to ask ourselves because Brazil is a signatory of Sendai's framework since 2015. So who is to be held for responsible for the avoidable losses we have so far? And uh, here we have some references and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Christine to present to us uh, the waste management in the pandemic, discussing the Brazilian case. In this first session, the discussant is Mr. Sidney Furtado. So uh, I will now give the floor to Mr. Sidney.
I don't know if he, if he, it was possible for for Sydney to join us today. It's, it's because he's from a, a emergency situation in the Campina city, I suppose. While we are uh, waiting for Sydney, if it is possible, Juliana, I have a, a, a well, the, the three presentation was, <laughs> was pretty amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, the speakers of this, this first session. But I have a, a, a little question for uh, George Gouveia. It's possible to... to, to sure. Okay, Jorge, uh, um, uh, yesterday a prestigious uh, hydrology of the Federal University of Viçosa, uh, Professor Ana Augusta Rezende, uh, said to us in a presentation in the Federal University of São Carlos that, uh, that traces of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, are being identified in the rivers of, of Brazil. Uh, I don't know if the water and storage uh, system, uh, uh, systems of treatment in the municipalities of the Sao Paulo state is able to deal with the kind of threat. Uh, and my question is if CETESB ha uh, has a, 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 any kind of role in monitoring uh, this kind of threat. Thank you, Norma, very good question. I, I, I couldn't mention, because I have not enough time to, to mention everything that CETESB is doing, but uh, specifically in this, in this talk, yes, CETESB last year started a program of monitoring the sewage system and the, the plants that treat the, the sewage in order to see the efficiency. And it's, uh, we put this in our plan for, for this 2021, this year. And it's, this program is ongoing, is on, 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 during this year. And Dr. Maria Inês, that is the responsible for the laboratories of here at the, at the office, is, is in charge of this subject. Very good question. What CETESB didn't do up to now, I think, uh, to, to put this to communicate to the, for the populate, population. Is it waiting for the result? It's important not only for to see the efficiency of these treatment plants, but also to see after the vaccine, how could the, 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 the SARS-CoV could decrease, uh, what, at least uh, what we wait. We, we wait yeah? So there are many reasons to do this. Remember that CETES is environment agents, but when, it, when I, I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, the mission is to protect the public health and the environment. So we, we are doing this. I'm not, of course, the, the person more appropriate to talk with details of the program, but Maria Inês, I could put in contact with you if you need. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jorge. I don't know if you have a, a other question, Juliana. I suppose in the chat. We, we have Norma. We have yes. a question for the researchers focused on solid waste. Was there any issue related to gender in the findings of your research? It's for both of us, all right? But yeah. maybe I can I can start. Um, in my case, while while gender was not on one of the main components of the research, uh, there is definitely a gender aspect, uh, an interesting gender aspect in the way uh, way speaking. Uh, population, the, the informal way speaking. Um, the, during this specific, uh, uh, during the resurveys, um, I think 
the, the, the demographics of the service or the way speakers that we found were uh, relatively uh, balanced between men and, and women. But for the previous uh, more qualitative approach that we took uh, when we did the interviews and, and talked with the people, with both the leaders and the people, um, what they were saying is that um, uh, way, the way speaking activities are uh, uh, some activity that is uh, 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 represents a life, uh, an important source of livelihood, particularly for women, because um, in many cases, uh, what these people, I mean, people who engage in informal way speaking uh, search is on one side to have um, some sort of um, independence in their in, in achieving their livelihoods. Uh, and many women who have um, Kid, many uh, kids and they need to take care of them. They leave other types of, of jobs such as uh, working as maids at home or, or, or working in some industry and the way speaking activity allows them to uh, have their own times in order to when they have the time. For instance, during the daytime, they go, they take care of the kids, they take them to the school and they engage in the way speaking activities at night. And in many cases, although this is not um, supposed, I mean, this shouldn't happen because it represents a risk for the kids, they even takes, uh, take the, their, their family with them, they take the, the children to, to the way speaking activities with them. That's what we found. And there is another question, the same uh, question asking about the, the articulation process among CTESB, City Hall, the state government. Yes, there's uh, too much, uh, too much things. Uh, Toward this, for example, CETASB has a, an agreement, a cooperation term with the, for example, fire department is a from government that we we exchange cooperation training, and even with the city halls the same, the civil defense the same. For example, in the city of Cubatão in Santos, Cubatão has a concentration of many, many chemical industries and oil refinery. And that's where it happened in that accident in 2015. We worked together with them previously, the accident and in during the accident, we have to work in both situations. We have to be prepared and we have to be prepared to, to respond. And what else? We received people here at CETESB school from civil defense, from city halls. And in the, we received, there is for any, uh, each, every course, CETESB, uh, because CETESB is a company and the courses, we pay for the course, but we offer, uh, we offer some opportunities for those in government institution to to take part of this training course, scholarships, of course. So there are many other initiatives between CETESB and the environment. Remember that CETESB is an, an environment agent and take part of the civil defense of the state of Sao Paulo. So we, we, it's, it's uh, not only, CETESB is not only uh, an agent that to give permits for the activities, license permit and to fiscalize. Obviously, we have to do this. It, it's a part of our uh, nature of existing. We, we have to do to fiscalize. But also, we, for example, when we went to, to Antarctica, a mission in Antarctica, it's not to, it's, it's more, more, more over to, to cooperate than to fiscalize, of course. So we have many, many uh, different actions in throughout the state. Well, I think I could just uh, share a little about uh, the gender question as well, waste management. And uh, in our specific approach uh, about the vulnerability dimensions, there was no issue particularly related to gender. But uh, of course, women, uh, especially thinking about the informal recycling sector, as well as the New Zealand's talking. They are more vulnerable during these activities. 
So here in Brazil, it's more common to see women uh, working as way speakers in associations because then they can have more, they are more safe. It's a safer environment for them. And men working as uh, individual way speakers or small groups. But uh, so uh, in this case, both of them were very much uh, impacted by the pandemic because even the associations had to stop working in most of the cases because um, the government would not say, would not confirm it if, if it was safe, if it was an essential service. So I think in general, it was, um, did, we did not have any specific finding about gender in this case. We have a question for Dr. Denise. What were the main challenges the pandemic brought for waste management in Bolivia? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so the, actually, uh, the field works for the research were um, much be, uh, before the, 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 the pandemic. The, but uh, however, uh, for what I've seen that was happening in Bolivia, I mean, something similar to what uh, Dr. Christina said, um, the activities, I mean, Bolivia, uh, as many countries in Latin America, at the beginning of the of, of the pandemic, because of the uh, the panic that people had, and, and because of what was happening in other regions, we had a really early and strict lockdown at the at the beginning. So during that time, uh, even people couldn't go out. I mean, you couldn't go out at all uh, during the house and the whole day. And obviously, the way speaking activities were. The, particularly the informal way speaking activities were um, impacted by that. I'm sure they were not able to to collect the, the recyclable materials as they usually did. And um, yeah, again, uh, related to the vulnerability aspects that have been touched already, um, this group, uh, the, the informal way speakers are are uh, quite vulnerable and also exposed, not only the informal, but also the formal way speakers because of the, these, uh, the, um, the masks and all the, the materials that can be a source of, of infection. So uh, I am sure this has impacted them uh, negatively in terms of, of their health and well-being. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Denise. What is the role of informal recyclers in waste collection public policies in Bolivia? So I didn't I didn't go into detail about that part, but we the first law I think in Brazil actually is is a, uh, a role model in many aspects uh, regarding the, the inclusion of, of waste speakers and the solid waste sustainability for of solid waste management in Latin America. But in Bolivia, the first law that we had uh, enacted specifically talking about waste management was from 2015 and. Uh, and this is quite, is quite recent, uh, it already six years, but I think the implementation has uh, been really slow. And uh, for even for that law, there was this many of uh, the NGO groups that have been worked for a long time with the way speakers were pushing for a, a may, a more inclusion of these groups in uh, and the, their rights and so on in the law. And there, it is to some extent they are mentioned, but still a lot of, of, of uh, more specific regulation is lacking in terms of, of, of the inclusion of, of waste speakers in the national law and uh, in the specific laws at the, at the local level as well. Probably some cities have more advanced, uh, advancement than others, but in general it's quite uh, missing still. Yeah. Norma, what about the time? Yes, I, I, I have a, a last question for Georgie, if, he, if it's possible. 
uh, I don't know. I, I, I have no much uh, minutes for that. But it is uh, about the uh, COVID-19 crisis in Brazil again, uh, George. Uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Paulo uh, Saldiva in uh, FAPE, FAPESP Lives uh, said that uh, uh, there are a lot of people uh, which have uh, sequels, uh, a, a kind of uh, problems of uh, a health problem that that uh, they not care properly uh, uh, his uh, his health. One of them is my question, not not Saldiva said it. Is my question. One of those there uh, uh, is uh, are drivers, drivers of uh, uh, cars, trucks, and buses. So I suppose that, uh, the the increasing of accidents in the highways of uh, uh, São Paulo city in in, in Brazil. And um, my question again is uh, about how. Um, uh, CTSB could uh, contribute in the process of monitoring this kind of the accidents related to co COVID uh, diseases in the drivers of these this vehicles. Norma, uh, Professor Norma, I'd say that in this case, this subject is much more concerned with the health sector, much more. Uh, we are in a different uh, competence. I say that we, 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 we did, for example, uh, there is a, an uh, environmental, uh, how can I say in English, a camera ambiental, environmental ambient, where the private private sector and CETESB work together. And one of these, this group uh, produced the last year a uh, cartoon uh, orient giving orientation to, to discard the mask. And I think uh, Dr. Denise, uh, I don't remember Dr. Denise, or someone talk about this, uh, or Dr. Christine. I don't remember, uh, maybe Dr. Denise. So CETESB produced it, but produced it together with the health sector, because here we have a difference of competence. Uh, it's very, when we start treating of the, the care of, about the, the health, it's much more with the health sector. I don't know if I understood your question, but I, uh, we have limitation uh, to do something about health uh, uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. George. So, Juliana, maybe we finish the, the, the first session? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, thank you so much for our presentation. We have to finish the first session uh, and uh, we will break uh, five minutes, Norma. Uh, to, to return. Yes. <laughs> Kelly is our uh, next uh, moderator. If you, you are available, Kelly, Rafael uh, is with uh, us. Maybe you, uh, we can uh, start the second session right now. What do you think, Kelly? Uh, for me, it's, it's okay. Okay. Hi, Rafael. Good to see you here. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Nice to see you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, for the speakers of the first session. It was an honor for us to, to see you and to hear your great uh, reflections about the environmental issues that we have in Brazil and Bolivia too. So Kelly, the war, uh, yes, you have the control of the next session. Yes, okay, but I, I think the Denise is chair, yes? 
Yes, yes, we, <laughs> I was oh, also sorry, a bit sorry, confused. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, my mistake, my mistake. You are our, 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 our president, uh, my mistake. <laughs> oh, it's a new role for Denise. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Kelly and oh. Nicholas are our main presenters in the se second session. Denise? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So after, <laughs> after the presentations, I will give the floor to uh, Kelly for, for the discussion. Uh, but uh, I will start with the introduction of this second part. Uh, well, uh, again, welcome to everybody. If anybody is joining uh, just for the second part, uh, bienvenidos a todos. <laughs> bienvenidos a todos. Uh, again, once again, thanks to Deliana for the invitation to participate and to chair, and um, also and also the, everybody who is organizing together with her. Um, I think I won't go much into detail of the of the of the proceed how to proceed because uh, most people I would say uh, they have joined already and they know that they have to uh, how to do the Q and A at the end or for anything that they want to share on the chat. So I will just directly go to introduce uh, briefly everybody. And so our first presenter for the second part would be Dr. Rafael Oliveira. Costa from the Public Ministry of Sao Paulo State. Uh, and he will talk about the role of the uh, prosecutors when facing a pandemic and the measures adopted in the field of public health. Uh, once, when I, before he starts, I will uh, go a little bit more uh, deep into, into this. Um, but he is a doctor and master and graduated in law from the Faculty of Law at Federal University of Minas Gerais. Prosecutor of Justice in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, advisors to the Operational Support Center of the Public Ministry of the Sao Paulo State, member of the Organized Crime Fighting Group, member of the Gaema Picpira Sicaba in Sao Paulo, and academic uh, director of the Sao Paulo Association of the Public Ministry. He was visiting professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, as well as visiting professor as the, at, at the Wayne State University. Um, after him is the turn of uh, Dr. Nicolás Rubido from the Universidad de la República Uruguay and University of Aberdeen, Scotland. He is an adjunct professor of the Universidad de la República in Uruguay based at the Department of, for Theoretical Physics of the Physics Institute in the School of Sciences. And he is also a, a research fellow of the Aberdeen Biomedical Imaging Center in University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Um, he was also an honorary research fellow of the Institute of Complex Systems and Mathematical Biology in, in the Mansion Scotland University. Um, then uh, we will have the presentation from senior professor Norma Valencio from the Federal University of San, Sao Carlos. Um, she is an economist mastering Education, a PhD in Human Sciences, and senior professor at the Department and Graduate Program in Environmental Sciences at the Federal University of San Carlos. Also, a vice coordinator, vice coordinator of the Laboratory for Social Studies and Research in Disasters. Um, she is also a collaborator professor at the University of Campinas, uh, both in the state of uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, finally, uh, our discussant for this session will be Dr. Uh, Christian, Kelly Christiane Yaros. Um, she is she's graduated in physics, a master in applied chemistry, and PhD in science physics. Um, her postdoctoral uh, she has postdoctoral internships in mathematical modeling, physics, uh, complex systems, oscillators, and control. Um, she is part of the complex systems research uh, groups at the State University of Ponta Grossa, as well as the oscillation control at the Physic Physics Institute of the University of Sao Paulo and the ICSMB group at the Institute of, for Complex Systems and Mathematical Biology uh, of the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, she is a member of the postgraduate program in chemical engineer and environmental engineer at the Federal Technological University of Paraná in Brazil. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody for, for joining. 
Um, so we can start now with the first presenter, um, Dr. Rafael Oliveira Costa. And as I said, the title of his presentation is The Role of Prosecutors When Facing a Pandemic, Measures Adopted in the Field of Public Health. And uh, the presentation is about the due to the health crisis of COVID-19, prosecutors assume a more relevant role in the field of public health. Based on best pra Brazilian practices, the, his study aims to determine how the prosecution service can overcome challenges and fulfill its mission while respecting human rights and rule law of law with the highest quality and efficiency. So yeah, you can take the floor, Dr. Rafael. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Norma Valencio for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about this relevant topic to this international audience. Second, I would like also to congratulate all the organizers of this important event in this complex moment we are living right now. Well, I would like to talk about the role of prosecutors when facing a pandemic. To make my presentation more didactic, I have divided it in three phases. First, I will talk about a general introduction uh, about health law in Brazil. Second, the unified health system, which we call here SUS. And third, Finally, the role of prosecutors when facing the pandemic. Well, uh, the Brazilian constitution states that health is a right for all and a duty of the government guaranteed by social and economic policies aimed at reducing the risk of disease and at the equal and universal access to actions and services for its promotion, protection, and recovery. Public health activities and services are part of a regionalized and hierarchical work uh, network and constitute an unified system here in Brazil. According to our constitution, the unified health system, which we call here SUS, is responsible for the execution of actions regarding sanitary and epidemiologic surveillance, as well as those relating to the health workers. I'm sorry, it's not sharing, okay, I'm sorry. Is it better now, Denise? I cannot see, uh, I don't know if anybody can see the presentation. Not, not oh, uh, you, Rafael. I don't have, uh, PowerPoint slides. Ah, I'm, ah I'm okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that's totally fine. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. We no say problem. No problem. That's the way I, I usually I I, I would I, I like to speak. So I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's totally fine. Because prosecutor is because prosecutor have a lot of things to <laughs> to say to talk with us. It's not necessary to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the way we are used to make uh, jury tribunals. So that's how I have prepared myself to this presentation today. So I'm sorry. Um, well, so after this very brief introduction, I would like to talk a little bit about our unified health system, SUS. The SUS, SUS, was established by law 8080 by, of September 19th, 1990. According to Article 4, it is composed of the body of actions and health service provided by public organs and institutions at the federal, state, and municipal levels of direct and indirect administration. Thus, federal, state, and municipal public institutions of quality control, research, and production of su supplies and medications, including blood and blood products and health equipments are also part of SUS. 
the private sector can also participate in the SUS in a complementary manner. Finally, the SUS does encompass, among other things, epidemiologic surveillance, which is defined as a group of actions that provide for the knowledge, detection, and prevention of any change in determining the condition and factors of individual or collective health. From now on, I'm going to speak a little bit about the role of prosecutors during when facing a pandemic. The pandemic continues to have a significant impact in many countries in the world and brings new challenges for public prosecutors. How, in such situations, prosecutors can carry out their mission with the highest quality and efficiency while respecting, at the same time, human rights and the rule of law. So that's the question I've made when I was preparing this presentation and my paper. And it's important to think about the implemental of usual, new, and expanded fun functions of the public prosecutor's office during the pandemic in Brazil and other states where prosecutors have broad competencies. We are dealing with our role in monitoring the necessity, proportionality, and adequacy of emergency measures. We are also covering the use of modern technology to monitor contacts and compliance with imposed quarantine and other health measures. In the criminal field, for example, we have been examining the continuity and adaptability of prosecutorial work. For instance, how to deal with priority cases, the suspension or extension of procedural guidelines, the supervision of investigations conducted by the police, and attention to specific crimes such as economic and financial crimes related to the emergency. Well, uh, uh, departing from this very broad view of the changes that we are facing, I would like to highlight six main aspects of the work developed here in Brazil. First, the restrictions introduced as a result of the pandemic have affected not only civil and political rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights with more risks that, the, that discrimination against certain groups. This particularly affects healthcare workers and racial and ethnic minorities, which can lead to hate speech, racism, xenophobia, attacks on enforced returns of refugees and asylum seekers, sexual violence, gender-based violence, and domestic violence. All of them have increased during the pandemic period and needed a specific attention from prosecutors. Second aspect, prosecutors have taken measures against new laws based on two grounds. First, legislation governing the enactment of measures in emergent situ situations must primarily respect non-derogable rights. And second, measures affecting other rights must be based on the overarching principle of rule of law and on the principles of necessity, adequacy, equality, proportionality, and temporariness. Third, prosecutors have been called upon to monitor the necessity, proportionality, and appropriateness of emergency measures outside the criminal sphere. Uh, the Brazilian Civil Procedure seeks through several legal statutes to offer a broad protection to collective rights. We have what we call collective criminal procedure or, or class actions. It's a type of lawsuit where one of the parties is a group of people 
who are represented collectively by a third part or a member of that group. And here in Brazil, uh, we have used this broad and flexible framework to initially uh, lock down cities through judici judicial decisions because some mayors were not doing so. In other words, mayors did not lock down or have taken initially uh, measures to restrict the social distancing. So prosecutors were filing suits to do so. And now, nowadays, we are facing two sorts of different challenges. First, to guarantee uh, access to ICU beds to all patients that are affected by COVID-19. And second, to guarantee that vaccination respects the priorities established by the government. Well, four aspect. During emergencies, special cooperation and coordination mechanisms have been established by prosecutors with other institutions, such as law enforcement agencies and healthcare facilities to make it more easy this contact and to show uh, the relevant information about uh, the pandemic. We are also taking into account the negative effects of the pandemic on the society as a whole, that is, the economic impact, the psychological effect, and the increase of domestic violence. It called for a new paradigm of interpretation of constitution adapted to this exception period. And six, in Brazil, the pandemic has changed the detention of people. It was already an exception to imprison a person. However, during, during the pandemic, we would imprison people only in very singular crimes due to the risks involved. To conclude, I would like to say that we have in Brazil a problem that makes the situation even worse, corruption. Corruption has always existed here. It's not something new. And I would say that we know it will not disappear completely from the society. The problem, however, is that there is no real citizenship with widespread corruption and impunity. It's, it is not a concentrated phenomenon here in Brazil. It happens from the bottom to the top among public officials and involves different branches. It also involves private companies in subjects related to health, such as medicines and vaccinations. Corruption is occurring right now during this pandemic period in, in using many methods, such as bribery, fraud, extortion, abuse of discretion, nepotism, among others. We are also seeing here in Brazil setbacks in the advance recently achieved with Operation Car Wash to the Brazilians, Operação Lava Jato. The prosecutors responsible for, for the investigations are being targeted by numerous approaches. Finally, the main challenge is to continue to exercise our functions as prosecutors in compliance with the human rights during the pandemic. To conclude, I would like to say that first, there are many reasons to have faith in the future. Second, days of social distancing are coming to an end in the world. Third, rule of law is mostly being observed. Four, we are facing a distinct approach to citizenship and the construction of multiple, multiple identities in society. And five, finally, 
it seems that one of the best ways to fight pandemics is through promoting citizenship. Thank you very much for the attention of all. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rafael, and sorry for the interruption and the misunderstanding. Um, we will continue now with the second presenter, which is uh, Dr. Uh, Nicolas Rubido. As, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the title of his presentation is The Resistance Distance as a Measure to Diagnose Bottlenecks in Transport Networks. Um, transport networks need to deal with an ever-increasing traffic flow. And this implies that designing or modifying infrastructures such that they avoid the emergence of traffic bottlenecks, offering some redundancy for possible path diversions. In this talk, he will present the resistance distance as a measure to quantify the presence of structural bottlenecks in transport networks. Uh, you can take the floor, Dr. Nicolas. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I hope you can see the presentation. So yes. I, I want to thank as well the organizers for the invitation. This is a very nice conference uh, and I hope I can instill some, some topic to discuss further. Um, what I want to talk today is about the resistance distance, which is a, a measure for networks. And in particular, I'm going to use it to, as a tool to diagnose the structural bottlenecks in transport networks. So um, I'm no expert in transport networks, but when I think about transport networks, then I think about something like street or road uh, transport. And then you have situations where bottlenecks would be then something like traffic jumps. Uh, I put here two pictures of Sao Paulo and Jakarta um, that are famous for their uh, traffic jams. Uh, you can visit as well from, well, these are two articles from the BBC and the Guardian, and you can visit as well the Mobility Index Sao Paulo, which is a nice web with all data about like how um, roads are being tran transited. Um, this is a worldwide problem, especially uh, for cities that have been designed and developed uh, with a car mentality, where there is this uh, uh, circle or like the automobile dependency, where you can increase the infrastructure, for instance, adding lanes to, to the streets. And this basically uh, prevents conge congestion, but at the same time, it increases the traffic flow to the point that eventually a new uh, bottleneck appears and traffic jumps occur. So it's it's a reinforced uh, circle that is hard to break. So the idea with with uh, with the metric of resistant distance is simply to have a tool to diagnose this before uh, traffic jumps occur. Now, when I'm talking about transport networks as well, I, I'm not really thinking specifically about street roads. Or, or road networks, although I will be focusing on this today, but you can think of this as well as uh, any kind of transport or either by other means of transport. So you can talk about like cars, but you can talk uh, as well about electricity being delivered or even information packages. So this analysis as well is, uh, it can be used in different uh, dimensions. And here I am showing um, kind of like a city street uh, maps uh, from the open source lab, where the first part is how to translate these city street maps into a network. Uh, and for that, it's like you can also um, take into account some inherited property of the city. So these ones are purely topographic, but in the right ones, uh, I'm showing this nice project which shows how cities look like corals. It's called Coral City Projects. It's an interdesign. And what they do is like you can start in any point of, of a city and then start transversing it through the streets, um, like outwards. And you can map all the points in the city like as, as if they were trees growing from, from, or from a root. Um, 
This has also the advantage of inheriting, in, inheriting two properties. One is the distance between points, and the other one is the capacity of the road. And this defines a network with these properties, and then you can analyze uh, this network and try to see if uh, maybe one of these streets will be uh, congested uh, to the point that a traffic jam occurs. So once you have the framework, which is the transport network, then you go to the analysis, and that's basically on the network connectivity measures. Um, and that means, well, you can either measure things related to nodes. Uh, in a city road, nodes would be junctions, and the edges would be the links between these junctions. So these would be the streets uh, or the roads. So you can measure things that are node-related quantities. You can measure things that are edge-related quantities. Or you can even measure things that are network-related, and this is a, as a whole. So for instance, here I have several measures that has, have been used in the past, degree, clustering, closeness, and so on. So degree, for instance, here I have a, a, a network on the bottom. And the green node shows high degree, meaning that there is a junction with uh, several streets coming out of it, and a low degree node, which has a single uh, road coming out of it. So this could be a dead end in a, in a city road. Um, and then you have edge-related quantities like edge betweenness, shortest path, sinuosity, and so on. Um, and this is basically how long or how far I am between two points in a network. Um, and here it's where the ed resistant distance enters as well. This is an edge-related quantity, but I will show you that it's more than just an edge-related quantity. It's also involving the whole network in spite of being something that is measured between two points of the network. There are, um, as, as you can see, several other metrics of this. And these as well have been related since the 80s with other phenomena. For instance, in physics, it's percolation phenomena, which means like when happens, like here I have a map of San Francisco from this uh, work. Uh, and you can see like at some point, then traffic jumps start to occur. And this is, um, the, the traffic basically here along these lines holds. Um, so some empirical studies, once you have the network metrics, you can correlate to the data on the, on the traffic flow. And for instance, some studies conclude that street connectivity has been linked to greater traffic safety and better housing prices. So it's not just the influence of the topography of the design of the streets, that affects the traffic itself, but it affects a whole other dimensions in the city. Um, networks with higher average nodal degree and nodal density have been associated with more walking and cycling, less vehicle travel and lower transportation. Other measures such as orientation entropy that I haven't measured, mentioned, but it's a, a network related quantity has been related to the streets disorder, revealing different design logics behind transportation technologies and cultures. Um, you can see that kind of trait in the South American cities, which is very much like uh, Barcelona here in the bottom, whereas other cities in the world have a more disorganized, especially in Europe, um, because they weren't at the beginning uh, aggregating themselves based on cars. Um, Star-shaped cities have been reported to alleviate trade-off between climate change mitigation and adaptation, and this is from this work, where you can see I have place two city maps from uh, Iran and Italy. And these things then clearly show that uh, network analysis can help into understanding or, or, or both diagnosis and um, forecasting problems in the city that may emerge. And then we can analyze and try to, to affect before they happen. So going back to the network, um, and in order to introduce the resistant distance, I have to talk about um, how the network is conformed. And that means once you have a, a city, a city map, 
you can have a, like the USA road network, you can make it topological, meaning that you only care whether two junctions are connected or not, or you can make it based on shortest path, meaning that the distance according to the road, and this is the map that I'm showing here on the left. This basically tells me how far I have to go. So this network inherits the property of distance. So when I analyze this network, then I have conclusions based on the distance that the, the roads have, or they can mean about road capacity, for instance, number of lanes, number of cars in a given time, and that's more directed to the Coral City project, uh, where the, the lanes basically define the thickness of the branches, or you can have as well traffic data, and you can have a more uh, informational network where you can see here in, in the bottom a uh, map of the Boston city area as time progresses, when there is free flowing traffic jams or a network collapse. In any of these cases, you have information about basically the resistance to flow. So the, the, the traffic jam is basically a, a, an infinite resistance to, to create a, a flow of traffic. And you can input this into the network. And basically with any of these uh, measures, you create something that looks like very abstractly like the picture on the bottom. And this is every junction then is joined by a link which has a certain weight. And this weight, is what I'm gonna call resistance, uh, the resistance to flow. Sometimes you can measure, like for instance, if you're measuring velocity, you're measuring something like conductance. So you're favoring or disfavoring um, traffic flow, which is the inverse of the resistance. But then once you have this, then you have essentially a matrix with different elements that also can take into account the directionality of the street. So if it is a one-way street, then this matrix will be asymmetric. So there will be a number on one side, but it won't be on the other side. And this is the connections between the junction five and the junction two and the junction four with the junction two and so on. So sometimes if you have a zero means that there is no street connecting uh, junctions one and six. Right, so once, I have the, the network, then I can move forward and, and try to analyze it with this other metric. Uh, I can also use the, the classical metrics about like how many uh, the degree has each node and this basically accounts for how many streets come out of this, this uh, junction. But the resistant distance, what it does is like it improves the analysis when, when we are doing with uh, shortest path. The idea comes or stems from circuit theory. In that case, uh, what you have is, is the charges flowing through a circuit, and then the intensity reaches to a junction where it diverts. It can go through two branches, for example. And in these two branches, then you have a certain resistance to flow. Um, so what happens is that the, these two branches then actually create a resistance that is lower than if they were separate. So the, the parallel resistors, they, they, they add up like this quantity. This means that if, if one as well is it, it's bigger than the other, then the flow will go through the smaller one, but at least it provides some sort of uh, decreased effective resistance. And this is the, the, the equation. And when actually you have series of resistance, one after the other, then what happens is you have an increase in the resistance to flow. And that this would mean something like uh, uh, in, in a city wise, you would have more and more cars jamming one after the other because of this series of resistors. So the, 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 the problem is like, okay, this, this view of circuit theory is, is well enough when, when things are simple, but what happens when you have like lattices or something more complex as any other city, and you want to go from point A to point B. And what the circuits uh, are telling you is that you have to calculate basically all the paths that you can go from A to B. And the resistance distance is the measure that accounts from, for all these paths. So this is why I was saying that it is a, a certain local measure because it tells me how easily would I go from point A to B, but at the same time, it has information of all the paths that can lead from A to B. 
the way that it's calculated, it's here, it's through uh, an inverse matrix known as the Moore-Penrose matrix, and it's through the Laplacian matrix as well as the network that I'm not going to go into details here. But basically, again, I'm repeating myself, but the resistance distance, is it's a measure that quantifies all the paths because thinking it uh, in a city-wise, sometimes the main arteries are the ones that have the most traffic in. So sometimes knowing uh, parallel paths will help me to uh, shorten the time that it takes from going to point I, A and B instead of just taking the, the, the arterial roads. Um, here is an example, a simple one. So I have four junctions joined by a street. And then when I want to go from one to four, what would be the result of applying this matrix calculation? What it does is like, okay, the, the network of these, of these street roads would be a matrix that has ones along the elements out the diagonal. And this would be the connection between one and two, the connection between two and three, the connection between three and four. This is a value one. And when I calculate the resistance distance, then I get a matrix such as this one, where again, the, the, the off diagonal elements remain being one. But now if I want to go from one to three, now I get a yellow, which is two, which is obvious because now I had to jump twice. So this is still a distance in a sense, and that's why it keeps the name. But the interesting thing happens when I have like more complex networks. Here I have like, let's say four cities connected with a few between them with a few roads. And when you analyze the resistance distance, you get a matrix such as this one, where you can see that the values of the connections within the cities are low, but intercity inter becomes high. And these are the points where you can guess that a possible traffic jam will, will occur. So then these matrix entries have different information. One is that parallel paths decrease resistance because it's a sort of improved redundancy in the transport network. The, then the, the serial path increase resistance. This means that because they are consequently one after the other, they decrease the traffic flow and then bottlenecks between any two junctions that we want to re reveal in the network uh, are revealed by this measure when you have large values. Um, and I leave you with the la last slide and to thank you all um, with the highlighted uh, publications of the, of the moment. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much. Okay, okay. Can you see me? Uh, no. No. <laughs> anyway, yes, uh, maybe I think something's wrong with my camera, but uh, I, we will continue now with the, um, with the last presentation, in this case from, uh, from Norma, uh, Professor, Senior Professor Norma Valencio from Federal University of of San Carlos. As I mentioned before, the title of her presentation is Intersecting Infrasystems Issues as Trigger Points of Multifaceted Crisis. Uh, Brazil has been moving towards the multiplication of disasters, including those of catastrophic proportions. This crisis exposed the problematic nexuses between different infrasystems, such as sanitation, road, energy, and communication, which point to the complexity of the sectorial challenges, as well as the arising of sub-crisis. Based on a, the dialogical perspective between sociology of disasters and complex systems, she will share her reflections on emblematic cases that occur in, in, their, in her country. Uh, Norma, please, can you take Thank the floor? You. Thank you very much. Uh, Denise, I'm, I'm sharing my presentation for you. Uh, firstly, I, I, I have to say uh, I'm especially grateful for Deliana and I'm very grateful for Deliana and her team from the University of Manchester uh, to this great opportunity to share with you some thoughts that I have uh, about the the infrastructure issues and the systemic crisis in the Brazilian uh, context. 
Uh, uh, my presentation is about the intersection intersystem issues, a strategy point uh, of uh, multifaceted uh, crisis. Um, uh, uh, very <laughs> quickly, uh, I'm covering three, three topics uh, which are not intended to bring anything new. Uh, there is a pretty <laughs> obvious uh, therefore, I bring them uh, more in, uh, in the sense uh, of refor uh, reinforcing their importance regarding the Brazilian context. The three topics are uh, an infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure as the sign about development, a uh, perverse connection between infrastructures uh, when everything changes around, and crisis uh, that is um, of the management uh, borders of uh, uh, their associate uh, infrastructures. Uh, uh, since, uh, since the 50s, such as occurred in other countries, uh, successive government, uh, governments in Brazil, especially uh, at the federal level, and which authorities were in different ideological uh, spectrum, choose for a development model based on the transition uh, to a highly dependent urban way of life in large uh, 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 infrastructure. As everyone, know, everyone knows, uh, these large investment projects uh, happily transform space, leaving, uh, leaving social and environmental scars there. Uh, uh, on the one hand, the official narrative about the benefits of these infrastructures almost completely mask their, uh, their uh, collateral effects. It has been uh, nearly uh, 50 years since Mary Douglas and Ludovisky warned about this, as well as nearly uh, 30 years since Giddens and Beck equally point out the inseparable perverse effects of so-called risk society or late modernity. More recently, authors such as Baumann and Bordoni, uh, Alan Turing, and again, Yurik Beck, have emphasized that the rhythm, uh, which requires intense special, uh, spatial modifications and generates metamorphosis uh, of risks, produces crisis after crisis. In Baumann and Bordoni words, it's perhaps the same immense crisis that feeds itself and changes over time, transforming and re regenerating itself as a monstrous teratogenic entity. Uh, Brazilian anthropologist Gustavo Ribeiro would said in 2012 that these large infrastructures become iconic objects in, in relation to it, any argument against them uh, seems too small and ineffective. The network of relationship that build these iconic objects involves a permanent articulation between large companies from different sectors, engineers and architect architecture offices, law firms, then technicians from public institutions who evaluate these projects, and of course, politicians uh, who occupy decision-making positions in government that approve uh, the projects and release uh, the money uh, for, um, for them. A huge infrastructure whose insertion modify and destroy ecosystems and ways of life, and Insignificant measures to put warn system, such as sirenes, sirens in the communities, uh, sounds ineffective since uh, the people won't uh, be in our time to save themselves. The feeling of impotence is so great that it becomes an additional component of the local uh, social suffering. For example, in recent years, in recent years, under a leftist uh, government, a large hydroelectric uh, power plant uh, was materialized in the Amazon rainforest, which was planned 
uh, in previous decade under military government in Brazil. Many of the social environmental compensation measures uh, for the affected indigenous and riparian people have not been uh, complied with. And when a dam safety risk occurred uh, at the end of uh, 2015, we failed uh, in the project. Uh, with the threat of uh, collapse and flooding the community immediately downstream, the affected, the affected people um, were also no properly heard and compensate uh, for the damage and losses they suffered. Uh, the, the main thing I want to highlight here is that the territorial modification, environmental damage, and social tensions uh, that this kind of infrasystem are producing generate energy for an integrated transmission system in national scale, and who main consumers uh, uh, are in the in the large cities uh, of the uh, central south region of Brazil, which seem not to have enough propensity to understand the relationship between the problems of the rainforest and its uh, urban way of life, the collateral effects of urban lifestyle are being carried on the shoulders of the others. The second aspect that uh, I like to, to highlight here, here is about the perverse connection between infrastructures when everything changes around. Infrastructures with different purposes are implemented by companies, organizations, institutions uh, that materialize their rationality about the use of the territory and of the social life that uh, will meet it. The overlapping uh, of infrasystems are create a double face, which is to make benefits, but also to produce a synergy uh, between risks, that is creating a qualitative, a qualitative, uh, a qualitative effect greater than uh, a qualitative side effect uh, greater there, uh, than uh, what the management modes of the sectors involved can deal with. Uh, uh, this required this require other sectors, organizations, and institutions from civil defense to residents' uh, association must be mobilized to mitigate the damage and losses caused due to the inability or insufficient um, uh, 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 of planners in designing risk dynamics compatible uh, with the environmental in which their infrastructure uh, try to read. Uh, each infrastructure institution adopts its own governance uh, uh, dynamics and repertoire of main, of meaning and operational uh, dynamics with different capacities and rhythm to understand, decide and deal, um, and deal with association to repair uh, the values, the values of the functioning uh, uh, of this implementation and management of uh, objects. So when the infrastructure cross one to another, these different rationalities and rhythm in rhythms need to tune it, uh, in as quickly as possible, but they have a, a lot of difficulty to uh, achieve it. Uh, to make it matter, uh, to make this matter horse, we are not just talking about organizational organizational dynamic that have the challenge of work at the same pace, but environmental dynamic may be um, uh, unstable, uh, such as uh, climate change issues, precisely by the development development uh, the the development development model that they said that the set of mega infrastructures uh, represent. For example, roads and the systems of water supply, planet, uh, planet uh, in the territory based on a, a history of hydrological dynamic, that is information from the past. 
However, the hydrological dynamics to base infrastructures need to deal uh, with probabilities of extreme, uh, extreme events soon, as well as a large degree of uncertainty in the wider future, more than make it this a uh, problem exclusively uh, to climatologists. It's necessary to ask uh, to ask to social scientists about how uh, the recognition of uncertainties can reformulate the demands the demand uh, for the services or products um, of these systems. For example, uh, it is changing the way of use of some system, uh, such as school, sport halls, and even cattle show parks, uh, which are being used in Brazil as temporary shelter spaces for community whose, ho whose homes uh, have been uh, flooded. Flooding crisis has become systemic crisis in Brazil, and the, com and the complexity uh, of infrastructures that suffer damage and uh, require uh, repairs is significant. In addition to the loss and damages, uh, this causes uh, uh, to residents local buildings requiring the uh, spend, uh, deter uh, of money to fix things. Um, that will break down again uh, in the next uh, flow, unfortunately. The last reflection that I want to share with you is that the uh, crisis targeted by the failures of uh, association infrastructure are not only desolation and failure, but clues uh, to uh, changing of the de development model. Uh, if you saw the mentality of the public entity make it possible. A crisis targeted by the failures of association infrastructure escape their management boundaries. First, for the complexity uh, of contemporary crisis, uh, it is a matter of institutional survival uh, to recognize that uh, the problem that uh, they need to deal with uh, uh, are beyond the logic of the institutional uh, culture uh, in the present days. We live in an area of systemic uh, crisis and systemic risks that uh, are bringing novelties in the way that uh, they materialize. Um, for example, uh, in Brazil, different types uh, types uh, of crisis are occurring in the same uh, in the same cities. Uh, this is a photo I took uh, of a poor community in Manaus, uh, state of Amazonas. Um, it's the capital of the state of Amazonas. Uh, this photo I, 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 I took in 2009 whose circumstances are identical uh, to those that are happening today which is which uh, shows that the institutional that the institutional reaction time to uh, predicate uh, predictable phenomena is too slow um, for this day uh, for these days in Amazon region the health crisis related to uh, COVID-19 occurs at the same time of a uh, fl uh, flooding crisis, at the same time of the crisis of public uh, uh, security, uh, etc. Um, uh, this crisis of public security is related with attacks of uh, criminal factions on, on public uh, equipments including public transport, transportation and ambulances. All of this put in suspension the vaccination of the population, uh, as well as closed the public transportation and the services of the schools. The problem here is how not to reduce one crisis to the features of the another, that is, to make the rationale of the sectors, of the all sectors involved, friendly enough uh, for the citizens to be able to see a light, a light uh, at the end of the, of the tunnel. Uh, this is a, a, a similar uh, situation in the countryside 
in the state of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is some of the books related to the issues that are shared with you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Oh, I see that uh, Sidney Furtado is with us now. So I ask it to Kelly if it is possible uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, Kelly, it's possible to share your space with Sidney Furtado who have time enough to this. Kelly yes, is yeah, our, sure, sure, of course. Yes, Kelly is our main, dis, uh, main discussion uh, in this second session. And Sydney was the discussion of the previous uh, session that, that uh, uh, we had uh, today. Denise, it is for you, you are the moderator. Yes, totally fine. So I will give the floor now then to, to Kelly and Sydney for, mm -hmm. for the discussion section. Okay, Ke Kelly, the, the, the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if he, Sydney uh, would like to start or I can start and then uh, we can share our space. What do you prefer? <laughs> Oh, hi, I'm Vinicius, I'm an engineer in Brazil, and I, I'm working with Sydney here in Sao Paulo Civil Defense. So how we can share our, our job, or we can talk about and in this image in this video. Okay, and, and then uh, let me start this, uh, because uh, uh, I... I have uh, so many annotations in my uh, table here. And oh. thank you um, all the, the organizer. Uh, for me, is a good pleasure to be here. Uh, the, this, this, while all the, the presenters in this workshop it related uh, in so many information about the social problems, uh, ambiental problems, economic problems, and the stakeholders' problems. Uh, um, in, in my view, uh, all the, the important things in this, uh, these talks is, is connected. In, in, the first, in, in the first time, it is separated, but uh, in, final, uh, in final view, it, it, this information are connected. Uh, first, the, the professor, the, the Dr. George uh, Denise and the Christine uh, talk uh, so many things about the ambiental uh, and, the, and the connection the economic and social uh, information. But it, um, I would like to, to give the, the thanks for this information. And the, I have uh, just a, a few comments about this. And then I, I uh, pass my, my, uh, my time for, for Sydney comment this. Uh, Professor Christine uh, talked about the, the WASP and so many times, and this is one uh, subject interesting for me because uh, I uh, work in a in, uh, university and uh, we look for the so many things in the uh, environments about the, the ho uh, hospitalar uh, waste. This is a good problem uh, to study because uh, uh, sometimes uh, materials cannot uh, recyc recyclable, uh, like uh, infected uh, um, subjects you insert in your pill or in your uh, bonds, and they, it, this is contaminated, and then you cannot uh, recycle this. The good solutions for this is uh, um, Encapsulate the the use of this uh, equipment, and then uh, we can uh, put this in a big containers 
and then uh, stay in this uh, in in his, uh, behind the the hospitals or in in um, specific places of the arms and then but uh, uh, it cannot recycle. This is a, a big problem in our society. Uh, I think uh, the good solutions we proposed in our book, I, I look for this book because we put in the, the Christina put in the, the chat, the link for the book, and then I assess it. And I saw so many suggestions for community. Uh, how provide this, how uh, you can uh, reunite our, our community and they suggest the, the um, solutions for the worst. This is good. Uh, and the, I think this is one, the best uh, way for our uh, government. Um, about the, the Dr. George, uh, I, I listened to the talk and the, I saw so many problems about the, the traffic together, the ambiental uh, environment. This is uh, uh, a good uh, point because it, always we can see these accidents. Uh, in this week, I saw in state of Paraná, Paraná state, one accident like this two cars uh, crash and then one uh, truck uh, stuck in this uh, crash and then uh, put uh, put out uh, uh, all the oil the vegetal oil in the uh, road but uh, in in around this road uh, there is one river the important river of the the Paraná state and then the, the, the cautions of this society about the, this, this case is not clear for the population because of the information. Uh, how, how, how good is our um, journalists about the information? Because sometimes the information is not clear and the, the information is not real. Uh, this is... I think the information is one, uh, one the the most uh, complicated problem in in our life. Uh, in ambiental cases, is like this. We have a, a one time ago one big problem about the ambiental cases in Vila Velha, one park, important park in Paraná State. Uh, and they involved not just the ambiental cases, but uh, the electricity cases. And then how uh, they fight the ambiental cases uh, with the big companies of the, the electricity. Uh, and then I think this, this work is related to uh, Nicolas Rubido presentations because of the traffic of the energy involved the, the, the uh, talking. Uh, I, I have uh, annotations of separated cases, but um, um, and the Denise uh, talk is amazing because she compared so many things and they present the statistics ab about the the cases in in, in country, uh, and I think they compared it with uh, uh, so many things is good, and and then I I don't know if Sydney. Uh, their considerations about this now, please. Uh, Hello. Yes, yes, we listen to you now. Hello, my name is Sidney Furtado, I'm director of Civil Defense Campinas. Thank you for uh, taking invite. Uh, engineer uh, Vinicius, to make a presentation. So, the importance the system of risk in resilient cities. Então, Vinicius. Hi, I'm Vinicius, and I'm an agricultural engineer in Brazil, and I'm working in Sao Paulo Civil Defense. So, if you want, I can share my presentation, or we can speak in an informal group. You have to 
decide that. <laughs> So in Brazil, we have a different types of ecosystems and realities in natural research. So we can see there is Cerrado, uh, we have uh, Atlantic for a uh, forest. We have another types of natural research. And in this actual system, in a pandemic, in actual, uh, reality. So it's a challenge for our population, and we have to decide, we have to discuss, we have to study, and we have to share our participations and our ideas about that. So we have uh, a framework group, and there is in development a uh, new system to in inter interaction and decision making in this uh, reality uh, in Brazil. So how we can see, we have in Sao Paulo, some expanding the data system, and we have to uh, share and uh, choose these facilities and investment those measures. So how we can see here in Sao Paulo, we have uh, actual government and in Brazil, and we have to decide how we can have to development this future uh, to our communities and to share these uh, decisions and participation management of the risks. So uh, how we can see, we have indigenous populations in Brazil, and there is uh, a population that have a poor situation and in this uh, actual pandemic uh, reality. So this is a, a new bridge and greater communication between so social systems. So it's a particular, uh, system in Brazil, and we have to uh, involve and share this experience in indigenous and native communities. There is increasing uh, diseases in these populations, and we have to decide and to take to take a decision about this health uh, population. It is uh, difficult in Brazil because we have a different types of realities in this type of uh, populations. So uh, how we can see, I have to share with you um, these frequent disasters in Brazil. We have fires in forests, uh, we, can, we can say in Amazon, in Cerrado, uh, with this our actual reality in pandemic uh, situations. There is uh, so many risks to involve in this, uh, yeah, in this space. Uh, Uh, okay, so uh, there is a common idea between us about this making cities resilient. So it's a common knowledge in our group here in this presentation. So this is a, a theme, uh, ideas for uh, resilient cities, organized, for disaster resilience, identify, understand, and use current and future risk centers, um, a financial capacity for resilience, and something about urban development and designing, uh, something about safeguard natural 
and functions about nature existence. Something to about uh, institutional and organizations in Brazil, about the government, about the companies, about the population, about our population, about our community. So another point in this uh, presentation is about uh, understand and make a participation in social uh, capacity for resilience uh, and increase uh, infrastructure resilience. Uh, so something about disasters and to make uh, uh, a strength and something about um, actual government in Brazil and expedite recovery and build better systems. So now in Brazil, we have a system of system to, uh, to development and discuss between our community and our universities and our governments and making making uh, our communities and our people to invite them to participate and share the ideas and the reality and the facts and the risks in in a app system to enjoy and increase our participation in making decisions. So um, our city actually, Campinas in Sao Paulo state, uh, we are development and happy and we are in the stage C. Uh, Campinas is a city, uh, in, actually, in a high level in this discussion in Brazil. So, uh, how I want to share with you our app. It's the first idea in our city to uh, communication and a participation with a great organization in Brazil called Fiocruz. And we are development, development uh, uh, app to, uh, so in this app, the population and the community can input and discuss something like uh, animal diseases and how it's uh, present uh, occurring in this uh, reality. About native animals and diseases and zoonotic diseases. So now I have to finish uh, sharing with you some recommendations to discuss in our next jobs. Promote a better understanding of multidimensional nature of risks from a systemic perspective. Engage key stakeholders to take part of design, planning and implementation of recovery efforts. Ensure policy and decisions are based on evidence, promoting the coherence and articulation of risk reduction, climate and development agendas, used to opportunities of COVID to prioritize resilience building and building back better and greener in the region. So something like a cooperation and, to, and transform learn lessons in effective mechanisms of regional collaboration. So uh, this is our first step in this discussion. 
and we can make another jobs, another webinars. So we are here to share and participate with you. It's it. Thanks, and it's it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if if, if uh, Kelly has any other thing that you would like to discuss or, or Norma. I think at the moment we don't have any any more questions besides that. Um, for for Sydney, no. But yeah, I have a question for for Rafael, for Doctor Rafael, Nicholas, and the Norma. Now I, my view. My view. <laughs> go, go go ahead, <laughs> Kelly. Uh, uh, Denise, how much time do we have? We are a little bit uh, beside, yeah, behind. I mean, we were supposed to finish like five minutes ago, so maybe I don't know a few more questions, and okay. then I, I can I finish. Can, I, can, I can generalize if ever. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Denise. Uh, thank you, Doctor Rafael, Doctor Nicholas, and Doctor Norma for your uh, presentation. Uh, you present uh, the interesting views, and the, I have a main question uh, about the the some points, but uh, I need to generalize it, and then I think uh, so many things lost in in our discussion. Uh, first, the doctor Rafael uh, told us so many things in, important, but I think the the main uh, case is SUS. Uh, as you as uh, the, the 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 system of the the our uh, Brazilian government, and then um, uh, this is a like a, a bottleneck of uh, our government now, because uh, we have uh, one pandemic case, but uh, this is this is crazy because we have a pandemic, but pandemic crisis um, in in continuous time. Like uh, uh, infection, um, um, the obesity, uh, like uh, um, um, immunodeficiency of virus. Uh, um, but uh, uh, what's the, the main problem? What's the the, ne the, the, the bottleneck of this case? Uh, the efficiency of the latest of the, 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 the spaces in our uh, government, uh, yeah, in our uh, state of the hospitals. But uh, this involved not just the, the public, but the, the, provide, uh, the private system uh, too. Uh, and the industries and the ambiental cases and the everything in this case, because uh, uh, like, it, like in this point, uh, in our view, Dr. Rafael, do you think the, the companies' donations, the, it's a, this is a, just a, uh, donations for the, uh, the, the, good cor the, the good hair, or this is uh, propaganda for our proper industry? Um, good morning, Kelly. Well, that's a nice question. Um, uh, I don't know whether I've got the, 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 your intention with the word donation. By donation, you mean donation of uh, medicines, vaccines, or just donation of money? Uh, mean, sometimes sometimes uh, we talk about the money because it's, uh, the, the donations, when, when the, the journalists talk about this, uh, sometimes talk, uh, oh, the medication donations or, or the, the kids donation, but in, in final cases, it's money donation. Yes. Okay, because we have two, two aspects here. One aspect is the vaccine donation because the U.S. is now donating vaccines to Brazil. So... Um, I think it's part of the um, good policies between countries, but it's also uh, a way to uh, show uh, uh, the, the advantage of 
the product they have in the US. So I think there are two, uh, two views involved in this donation. But concerning the money donation, I would say that it's the, the question is even more complicated. It's very complex to understand uh, the relation between um, the, the uh, helping someone else and trying to make some kind of propaganda. So I think there are, there we have two perspectives here. It's 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 not that it's not a way to make propaganda, but I think in the very beginning of the crisis, it was much more people were much more concerning with helping others because we were facing something completely new that we haven't seen before. So I think that in the first in the very first beginning of the pandemic, we really had uh, people. Uh, showing their altruism, they wanted to help others. But now what I think is that things have changed and there is still some altruism and people trying to help others, but I think there is lots of propaganda involved in making donations. It's not that it's, uh, it's, it's not that donations are not important. They are important. I think they are essential. But it also involves an aspect uh, which is uh, some sort of propaganda. And what, uh, uh, um, what worries me more is that sometimes it could be used um, in a way to, to sell their products. So they could make that donation and they put that donation in the mass media to show that they are doing that. So that sort of donation usually involves a way to make some propaganda. And it's always something that should be seen with very, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, seen with some, some uh, I would say, some, uh, with, with a different view. Because on one hand, it could uh, bring lots of, uh, chances to people who do not have chances now, but on the other hand, they could involve some sort of corruption behind what they are doing. So I think that we have, we as prosecutors have to take some uh, care with these donations and see what is the real purpose to avoid some sort of propaganda behind what they are doing. So that's my point of view and thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Dr. Rafael. Uh, this is my point of view. <laughs> this is good uh, consideration. And to connect it, Norma, in this discussion, and um, I think it, this is a main point of the, the transformation of the society. Because uh, uh, when you, when the industries like, like I told you about the industry, but not just the industry in this case, because the transformation of the, the society is about, is about a little bit points and points and points. But uh, the transformation of the society about the donations like this. Uh, because we have a, a cases when the big uh, stakeholders and the big industries gave money like a valley and then uh, buy the, brought the, the houses for the person and then uh, for the population in this in this specific area, but uh, what's the main information in this in, in now is the situation of the state, the state of the the, the Mariana or like yes. uh, around, uh, yes. or the donation of the house. Oh, it's a very good point, Kelly. Thank you for your question. Uh, it's a very uh, critical situation, a very a complex situation, because the, the let me point uh, uh, out, the, um, uh, the industry or oh, the big, big business, like this type of company, has a lot of branches inside the governmental apparatus, the institutional apparatus. So when this kind of company 
uh, make a, a kind of, uh, a lot of transformation in the territory and change the environmental dynamics and creates a, a collateral social uh, uh, effects, etc. The company is an uh, enemy, uh, enemy of the social environmental previous condition in that uh, space. But the problem is a little bit more complex because the institutional apparat apparatus is expected that, uh, that the institutional apparatus could protect it, could, uh, could care of the affected people, and uh, as well uh, as well as the affected uh, ecosystem uh, involved, but uh, the big companies has uh, lobbies inside the institutional apparatus, so the evaluation that the apparatus uh, did of in terms of the impact of that disaster is minor that the citizens are expecting. So the, uh, there is an unfair, <laughs> unfair uh, balance within these three kinds of actors, the governmental institution, the big companies, and the people in local communities, uh, mainly the indigenous and the riparian and quilombolas communities, uh, because the link uh, between these three uh, branches né, is not a perfect link in terms of a sustainability uh, uh, relationship. So uh, for the public ministry, for the prose uh, prosecutor's uh, initiative, is very, very important in my point of view to, to put uh, their eyes in this kind of connection of institution of uh, civil defenses, for example, and the relationship of uh, uh, its members uh, with, the, uh, with the big companies that uh, provoke uh, a lot of disaster in Brazil. Uh, uh, one information that I, I, I uh, linked to the Rafael, uh, the question that uh, you did uh, to, to, to Rafael um, uh, Kelly, is uh, 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 I have a, a, a study that I, I, I make with uh, Arthur Valencio and Murilo Batista about the, rela the relation with the health facilities in the municipalities of Brazil and the emergency decrease in Brazil. This study, this study will be published by the uh, University uh, of Manchester, uh, uh, a book uh, organized uh, with uh, Deliana Iosifova. And uh, in this study, we proved that the, there are a, a huge connection between the municipalities with less uh, uh, health facilities and the more level of emergency decrease related to uh, another uh, type of, of crisis, not only health crisis, but a food, uh, a food crisis, a drug crisis, and another type. Uh, so the, fragi the fragility of this kind of infrasystem is correlated of the fragility of another uh, equipment in sanitation, in sanitation issues. Thank you for your question, Kelly. Thank you, Norman. And the, the finished part, uh, I connected Nicholas to this discourse. And um, I like very much the, your work, not just because I work with this time too, but the, the main situation in this case is uh, the network can be connected all the works in this, this uh, room. Uh, Nicholas told about the, the traffic, but uh, this is not just about traffic, because, because uh, he can uh, put another things in our nodes and then simulate the situations in our world. Um, if he, if he, uh, I, if I, I am not uh, sure, please correct me. 
but uh, you can connect, you, you can um, adapt it your topology for any things, any cities and how the world. Uh, yes? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, that's completely correct. The, the network uh, approach, let's say, can be used even to, to treat uh, multiple of systems as interconnected uh, networks. So, um, I think yeah. uh, Sydney was just mentioned a system of systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, you can also create a network of networks and analyze this network of networks and how these interdependencies appear um, throughout with the resistance distance and the other network metrics. So, indeed. Yes, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, to connect Sydney in our discussion now, uh, this is. Uh, a kind of very particular, but not just particular, because we have a big uh, problem and a, a big solution in the same time. Because now we are talking because we have an internet, but uh, our internet uh, sometimes is not so good. And this is a big problem in every time. Uh, the main the main problem is identification uh, about this in education like education. Uh, sometimes the universities stop the the uh, uh, room the, the classes because uh, uh, the students cannot uh, uh, have a, a good internet in, in your houses, and and sometimes we talk and then our video completely stop. And uh, we we talk. Wow! But my internet is good. And then what? What's happening now? Uh, I think this is is complain uh, completely uh, explain about in in the Nicholas uh, um, work because he shows us about the traffic and this traffic is about the internet, like like internet, like uh, signals in in our houses. Uh, one curiosity, uh, I don't know, but uh, if, he, if you have uh, this information, but uh, now uh, a big part of the population stay in houses, in home office. Uh, this is increasing or no, our systems? Like electrical systems and, and networks about the internet, uh, this is increasing or no? I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Sorry to say, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm expecting that, yes, but uh, I'm not sure. Yes, I think I think it is. I, I, I provoke, I, I, I stuck this because I have no information about this I'm completely clear. Uh, we, we can look for this information, but it, it's not clear like a, we have a disinformation for this. No, this is like a, a interlines. This is a, a occult in, in, in so many works. But I think it's one, one good uh, future stood because study because uh, um, I think I think increase the because. Uh, we stay in houses and then uh, using more electricity and the internet. Sometimes the persons cannot use the internet in your house, but uh, using the our neighbors and then uh, the flux it's changing a little bit or uh, much. I don't know. I think this is a good uh, subject for for the future. Yes, and maybe if, if, if maybe one problem is the the not only the 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 risky are systemic nowadays, but the the scale of the risky is changing. Nowadays we have the trans scale risky related, uh, for example, uh, to this kind of issue, uh, Kelly. It's a, a main challenge that we have to, to deal in the education, in the other uh, public policies, I, I suppose. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everyone.
I, I have a, just a one finished question for everyone. Uh, <laughs> do you think the, the situation, every, every situation of, uh, present here, like a waste, uh, traffic, uh, uh, in a governmental situation, um, uh, networks uh, for uh, uh, in specific cases, um, and the, the public health, uh, every, every situation. Do you think it, this is changing in next year? <laughs> so... Because so many problems are here is uh, problems about the years ago, yes? Is this not just for the problem about the, the yes. COVID situation? Is this an accumulated problem? Yes. Yes. Please, uh, Sydney, I think you, you can talk. Yeah, I want to talk with you. Our difficult situation about our actual government. It's horrible, and you have to change the situation, you have to decide and choose another person to govern Brazil. No. And I want to listen all them and about this situation <laughs> and our idea about that. We have to change, we have to decide, we have to share with our population, we have to Choose another person now. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe the education is the way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. We have to put uh, importance in our universities, in our organizations. We have to change this actual situation. It's so important to us. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sydney. Okay. And, uh, now, Denise, I give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So we went a little bit uh, more of, uh, from the time that we had planned, but I think it was worth it. Every, I mean, we had a, a nice discussion uh, from both of the sections. And yes, uh, I would just like to thank once again to the organizers and to the, all the presenters, the discussants, and also the participants attending the the webinar and just remind them that the next session is on June 22nd. We, I think we have like three or four more sessions for the Infra Plus uh, series. And the next one is on June 22nd about uh, the, with the topic of violations. So yeah, that will be it. Thanks everybody. It was good to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.